Thank you for joining Marianne Gebauer podcast. I am so delighted to be joined by Fergus O'Connor Greenwood, who is invisible right now. Um, he does not have a camera on his computer. So Fergus, hello, welcome, and thank you for joining me today. Hi, Marianne. Thanks for having me on the show. So, okay, so tell me, you are, um, we were laughing, I said, do you want to change the name here to Fergus O'Connor Greenwood? And you said, no, F-O-G, it stands for? Fog of War. <laughs> but it's also Fergus O.G., as in uh, O.G.'s original gangster, so uh, it's just a play on that. <laughs> okay, so Fergus, you are extremely, I think, famous for this massive book, 180 Degrees, um, Unlearn the Lies You Have Been Taught to Believe. It's a book that you took six years, apparently, to write. And yeah. um, a fascinating book that I can't wait to dig into. I actually just ordered it. So I brought it with me uh, to Costa Rica, and I'm planning on digging into it. Tell me, first of all, a little bit about yourself, and then we'll talk about the book. <clears throat> Okay, so I originally did a degree in mathematics. I also have a master's from um, a Dutch business school, TS. Spent 16 years in the corporate world, uh, then jumped out of that and did some uh, business turnaround in the SME sector and eventually got around to writing the book. Which took six years. Yeah, if you take in all the research, uh, the writing, the editing... Um, production um yeah i'd say somewhere in the region of probably of 15,000 hours incredible incredible well this is almost like an anthology of conspiracies what is your what's the entry level conspiracy for a newbie who maybe has not gone down any rabbit holes yet what's the first one that you would say go for a deep dive on it's 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 blatantly obvious I'd say 9-11 is the one for that uh, because uh, the official narrative contains several points that are actually impossible. And I think out of all the false flag events that we've had, that one um, is the best to study because it contains those. A lot of them, it's harder to pull out where uh, the inaccuracies are. They can be done. But what you really need is something that's absolutely impossible. And 9-11 contains several of those. And so in chapter three, we put a whole chapter into that because I think it becomes a building block for opening people's minds that maybe the government doesn't have your best interest at heart. So as I look through your table of contents, tell me there's something very strategic that you've done in your table of contents in terms of vagueness. <laughs> Tell me what you did, because I think it was rather interesting. So um, I think there's two elements to this. One is uh, I like to, I want to engage the reader as much as possible. And so my view was uh, to have uh, titles and subtitles that create curiosity and people wanting to know more. So for example, chapter 11 is called Quack Attack. Um, so I suppose from that point of, that was the main reason for doing it, but it does have the side effects of being quite useful because it's much harder for the algorithms to pick up on any keywords. Right. So th when you're talking about 9-11, that's chapter three, and the title of that chapter you just called Revelations. Yeah. Which is interesting. Um, and you've got some subtitles within that chapter, but your your chapters are quite um, curious, and they I think they would draw curiosity. They're 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 kind of humorous, um, and uh, yeah, very interesting the way you did that. But I I think it was clever because you're not going to get caught by the bots as much. Yeah. So and I think it's important also that, um, I mean, a lot of the topics can be too dry. So they need to, you need to inject humor where you can, mm -hmm. obviously, with the, some of the uh, sort of gravitas of certain topics, it makes it much harder. But you want to keep, if you're going to get the reader through to the end of the book, you really have to respect their time. 
and that means uh, writing in such a way that it's a page turner, hopefully, and uh, keeps people engaged throughout. Right. So 9-11. Uh, 9-11 was my wake up call 20 years ago. Right. Um, if you're at a dinner party, what do you say to people about 9-11 to kind of spark their interest or get them pausing and questioning a little? OK, well, you've just hit on uh, quite a big topic, which is probably something we'll get into maybe later on, uh, which is how to uh, communicate the truth to others without alienating them. Mm -hmm. Because I think that's what you're really talking about. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. Uh, what matters is how you approach the individual that you're speaking to. Right. And uh, a lot of us go about it in the wrong way. So uh, do you want me to dive into some of those points? Well, yes, maybe, because I know that you you divide the population into five categories. So you've got this five by five matrix to identify each. Uh, maybe maybe we should go into that first, and then I will jump back and say on various conspiracies, what is, uh, give us an example about how to approach it. So maybe explain your five by five matrix so that people can understand um, how you categorize people. Okay, so uh, first of all, this is sort of a framework for understanding the mechanism of tyranny. Uh, I have to give a shout out here to James Lindsay, and also I think he references Charles Eisenstein and Jerry, uh, René Girard, because that's where I picked this up from. Uh, I've tweaked it ever so slightly, but uh, A, I think more people need to know about this because it's such a useful framework. And the reason I've started talking about it beyond that is it's a perfect introduction uh, for the stuff I do have in my book, which is, uh, yeah, that how to communicate the truth to others. So before you get on to how to communicate it, it's good to have a framework. So um, this five by five matrix, so it's just a spreadsheet. On the left hand side, running from top to bottom, we have the ringleaders, the strivers, the normies, the doubters and the rebels. These are just five simplified categories that you can put the general population into so you can get it, have a better understanding of uh, what we're dealing with. Across the top, we have um, five categories. That is a description of who they are, what tools are used to control them, what they're lacking, what their motivations are, and how to flip them. So if we take each of those vertical columns, starting with the description, and then run down the five groups, um, that should be uh, the best way of uh, explaining it all. So at the top, we have the ringleaders. Basically, uh, they create and direct the agenda. Below them, we have the strivers. Now, the strivers aren't really that interested in the politics, as long as they come out on top. The normies, well, generally they're mystified and confused as to what's really happening. The doubters, well, they're skeptical, but they don't really want to put their head above the parapet. And then we have the rebels, um, and they tend to be the uh, bullshit detectors. <laughs> now, the rebels category is a lot more complex than that, but uh, let's keep it simple in order to not get uh, too distracted. So uh, going back to the top again with the ringleaders and let's look at uh, the tools of control. So for the ringleaders, generally they're using blackmail and they tell others surrounding them that they're part of an inner circle. Mm -hmm. Now, most people who think they're in an inner circle are not in the inner circle. They've just been told they're in an inner circle. They'll probably only find out when it's too late that they're not but it's a very good way of drawing people in. For the strivers, they're controlled generally through incentives and threats. It's your classic carrot and stick. Here's a load of money and uh, you'll lose your job if you don't comply. Um, those two together generally herd most people along. Mm -hmm. Now for the normies, uh, you don't need to pay them. You just have to use propaganda against them. Uh, and that's how uh, they're controlled. The doubters, um, 
well, they're really controlled by the media demonization of the rebels. Mm. And quite often people think, well, um, if they've been targeted, it's because they've spoken out. That's true. But what's probably more important is they want to crush you in order that no one else uh, follows on and does the same thing. So it's really for sending a message out, uh, in particular, to the other doubters, but everyone in general. Now, for the rebels, they're much harder to control. Uh, so we have to go with things like censorship, cancellation, and in the worst cases, elimination. So let's go back to the top again and column three and talk about what each of those categories is lacking. So for the ringleaders, it's humanity and empathy. For the strivers, it's morality. For normies, they're lacking information. Doubters, they're lacking courage. And the rebels, they're lacking fear. OK, what are the motivations of those five groups? So the ringleaders are all about power and control over others. The strivers, they're just interested in money and social status. So, for example, uh, a classic example would be uh, the majority of the doctors, for example, um, or even uh, the MPs. Uh, normies, uh, well, they're motivated by the status quo. They just want to go along to get along and don't really want to be uh, bothered by too much and sometimes don't even want to know about it. Now, the doubters, they're motivated by fear because they don't want to stick their head above the parapet. And the rebels, well, again, it's more complex than this, but we can say they're generally motivated by truth and ethics. So the last column is, OK, that's the whole setup, but how do you flip each of those categories? Because what we're trying to do here when you're faced with tyranny is get as many people from as many different categories uh, to, and turn them into rebels. So like there's a cascading effect you need to bring into this of how you flip them uh, into the other categories. So for the ringleaders, that's going to be pretty tricky. Um, I think the only real way is if you obtain the blackmail material uh, that they're subject to, and then you can maybe do something with that or apply some pressure uh, and maybe even get um, who's above them, get them to speak on that. The strivers... Um, for them, the best way is showing them what's coming down the pipe. It may be that they're on the top at the moment, and yes, they've been incentivized and threatened, but if you can show that, yeah, but in two years' time, it's going to be you that's the victim of all this, then maybe you get them to think twice. This is the classic um, useful idiots category, and I would say... Uh, particularly a lot of the doctors, unfortunately, have fallen into this. And if you look uh, throughout history, the useful idiots are generally the ones who get shot first. Why? Because they're the most disillusioned and the most uh, wanting to jump into the rebels category when they found out what's really happening. And um, I was chatting with uh, Doc Malik the other day on a podcast, and um, this proved to be quite interesting to him because he was saying, OK, through all what's happened over the last three years, uh, they've moved from uh, visual interviews with your doctor. Now, it's at least in the UK, it's much harder to get an appointment. And if all the doctor is doing is consulting the computer over which drugs should be issued, well, they're going to then argue that AI can do that better. The problem is that when AI comes in, they don't have a job anymore. So they've sort of assisted that process. And of course, the problem for all of us is if our doctor's AI, what's to stop someone programming that program to start uh, dealing out nefarious uh, drugs or whatever in order to damage us? We've seen what's happened in the last three or four years. Why on earth would they not take that action later on down the line? So uh, that's the strivers. 
uh, basically show them what's coming down the pipe, that they're going to be the victims. But the great thing with the strivers is if you can flip them, they normally don't fall into the other categories. They flip straight to being a rebel. So this is, I think, you can argue the toss, but people like uh, Malik and Malhotra generally come out and are being very vocal about what's going on. So they've moved into the rebel category. Mm -hmm. uh, for the normies uh, to flip them, well, if you uh, recall, they're subject to propaganda and they're missing information. So what they need is the truth communicating to them. But how you communicate that truth is arguably way more important than what you're communicating. And we'll get on to that in a second. Uh, for the doubters, uh, well, if they're motiv motivated by fear, you could scare them to death, uh, i.e. give them something that's more frightening than what the government's suggesting. So an example here might be, for example, um, a friend of mine was asking about what they should do before uh, the vaccination for kids came in at schools. And I said, well, here's how it works in the business world or anywhere, really, is you need to make the headmaster's sphincter twitch harder than the government can. The government can threaten with maybe loss of job and suspension of pension, but you can go in there and say, well, actually, they're breaking the Nuremberg Code and they're going to be personally liable. And we all know what happened at the end of that. Now, I don't know of many cases where people actually did that. But I know in Chester in the UK, one guy took that approach and managed to get three schools not to have any uh, vaccinations on their school grounds because the headmasters are liable for whatever goes on on that. So that that's sort of an example of how that would work. And then for the rebels, we don't have to flip them because they're already there. So it might be worth just jumping back up to the normies because they're the biggest category and having a quick um, go through some of the points that are raised in chapter four about how to communicate the truth without alienating people. Mm -hmm. That's a really, that's a really important topic because I think we're very good at alienating people and we need to be more strategic uh, and more subtle in our approach. So uh, enlighten us. OK, so um, effectively, we have some communication hurdles, one communication trap and 10 solutions. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> for example, the first hurdle is, as Walter Lippmann said in Public Opinion 1921, we do not see and then define. We define first and then we see. So, um what that means is we decide on the story and then we go out to find the evidence to confirm that story, not the other way around. We all think everyone gathers the evidence and then makes a judgment. But generally, it's the other way around. And that's why the media have the power a lot of the time, because they're getting their story in first. Um, a, sort of associated with that, it gets attributed to Mark Twain. I don't think he actually said it, but he said something similar. It's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. So once you've moved them into a position, it's much harder to get them out of that position than it was to get them in there in the first place. So we have to understand we're up against uh, you know, the tide here. Point three, uh, and this is arguably the the sort of second most important of all the points. And it was Yuri Besmanov, the KGB defector, who said, uh, yeah, a person who is demoralized is unable to assess true information. He said, uh, the facts tell him nothing. And I think this is the point uh, you made earlier, Mar Marianne, which is evidence doesn't help in a lot of these cases. And that seems so counterintuitive. So he said, facts tell him nothing. Even if I shower him with information, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union, this was an interview he did in 1984, 
If I take him to the Soviet Union and show him a concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it. That is how hard some people uh, can be indoctrinated with propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that brings us to point four, and this is probably the most important one of the lot, which is something called the backfire effect. So there's the misconception is when your beliefs are challenged with facts, you alter your opinions and incorporate the new information into your thinking. Wrong. What actually happens is when your deepest convictions are challenged by contradictory evidence, your original beliefs get stronger. Mm. Okay. That, that's, that's an important point, isn't it? So we're actually sabotaging our efforts by making a very strong case. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and the last point is uh, people will, will forgive you for being wrong, but often won't forgive you for being right. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, what's that about? Well, uh, yeah, a compatriot of yours, Jordan Peterson, um, explained what was going on with this. He said, there's a tight correlation between your belief system and your dominus hierarchy uh, position. So if someone stands up and challenges your beliefs and shows you are wrong, they're integrating to the crowd that your position in the hierarchy of authority is invalid. So no one likes to publicly be shown to be wrong because you have this invisible counter in your subconscious, which is... If I'm shown to be wrong in public and my standing within the community is going to be lowered, your brain knows that if you've got a lower standing, you're going to have a harder life and therefore it doesn't want to enter that position. And therefore, people are happy to see others be wrong and forgive them, but they're not so keen if it's falling on them because of that uh, dynamic. OK, so. All those lead us to the communication trap and uh, the communication trap, which I and probably everyone else has fallen into is the following. Learn the truth, get angry at being lied to. This also inflames the truth tellers need to be right. Communicate that truth while still annoyed at being duped in an unconsidered way, triggering the backfire effect, rejection of the message in others. <laughs> become frustrated at people not seeing the truth, try again with even more evidence and conviction, fail harder, fail bigger. <laughs> and so it dawned on me that, well, the conclusion here is the truth movement doesn't have an evidence problem. The evidence is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It actually has a communication problem. So it's like, well, what do you do to overcome those five hurdles and that trap? And generally, when I'm giving talks, I give what are the 10 solutions. Do you want me to? Quickly Absolutely. Run those? Because you know what? I, I chuckle as you say this because I think all of us who are aware and are the rebels have had such a futile experience in trying to awaken others. Mm -hmm. It has been, <laughs> it, it, yeah, we just. For some reason, we're very ineffective. Well, I think we know what you would say. Of course, you're ineffective. It's the approach that you've taken. You haven't identified your party or your audience well. And so you haven't been strategic in, yeah. in kind of maneuvering with them. Um, so yes, in part, in part, the 10 truths here. And I think we all need to take notes. Okay. And internalize so, this. <laughs> yeah. So um, solution one is be kind first, be right later. Okay. Uh, so the analogy I give here is it's a bit like going to uh, the rescue dog's home. So in the UK, it'd be Battersea Dog's Home is the famous one. And try picking up a traumatized puppy. What are you going to do with them? You're not going to walk in there and try and teach it a new trick. You're going to give it love, compassion and empathy and maybe feed it. The same works with the human variety. Kindness first. Be right later. Number two. 
Oh, can I just, uh, I'm just going to pause on that one. No problem. Uh, and I'll just kind of give you the, the rebuttal that jumps to my mind is that we have been so ostracized by family and friends that we're not feeling particularly gracious at this point or like turning the other cheek or being very kind because we're, we're pretty frustrated. We're pretty hurt. We're pretty angry. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where maybe we need to reconcile all of that frustration um, before yeah, we try I, to communicate. I would, uh, to that, uh, Marianne, I would say three words, get over it. <laughs> Basically, this is the problem of being a truth teller. There's no joy on the front side and there's no joy on the back side of saying, I told you I was right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No point in saying it. You can do, but what's the point? So if you're expecting uh, any kind of plaudits or love because you're telling the truth, you're living in fantasy land because that's not how it works. Your prizes, you get to, you get to not be the victim. So, for example, I think it was Ian Rand who said, um, you can avoid reality, but you can't avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. And there is no better example I can think of probably than the last three and a half years of that. You can stick your head in the sand, be an ostrich, not listen to any of the information you've been told by the truth sayers. That's fine. But... For those who are vaccine injured now because they didn't listen, yeah, you are dealing with the consequences of evading reality and you didn't manage to avoid them. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, I think that's it, it. Look, I agree with you. It's a frustrating process. Um, yeah, there's no one slapping you on the back on either the front side or the back side. But, you know, would I rather be doing that than uh, be in my bed 24-7 with some, you know, being maimed uh, by what I'd, inje I'd injected into me or dead? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take the hard yards on the truth telling rather than the hard yards on the medical side. So essentially, you're, you're probably never going to hear an apology from people that have wronged you. Correct. Suck it up and continue on, be kind, be compassionate and generous. Yeah, so uh, the way we win this is we never give in. Yeah. And truth, uh, I mean, we can go into this as well, just like tangentially, but truth is an exponential function. Mm -hmm. It does nothing for a very long time and then does everything all at once. So we're getting towards the end of the it does nothing bit and into the it does everything at once. Don't give up along the flat line bit because you've still got the hockey stick to come. And there's a saying that uh, truth lives a wretched life but always survives the lie. Mm. So unfortunately, you're a truth teller. You're having a wretched life, but... Yeah. I think, uh, and yeah, I think there's another important thing here as well, Marianne, which is um, when all this finally does come out, and it will, uh, I think those who know what's gone on now actually need to double their compassion for others, not reduce it, because we need some of us to, um, you know, <clears throat> hold that mental space where, um, you know, our whole, whole world hasn't just collapsed and there's going to be a lot of people. I mean, I've been lucky in that maybe I've had nearly 20 years to wake up. Some people might get 20 minutes. Yeah. And that is going to be very, very hard um, for those people. Yeah. And so uh, put your ego to one side and just show them some compassion. And actually that's an important point because we've had a long time to digest this and uh, reconcile it in our minds, a lot of time to emotionally prepare, grieve, prepare. But can you imagine having all of this in very short order, you know, the truth, kind of the revelation of what's really going on, you're going to be in trauma. 
and we're going to be surrounded by traumatized people. So we need to. Yeah, because it's not just in one silo, it's in multiple silos. Absolutely. I mean, I've tried to cover a lot of those silos in the book, but yeah, um, yeah, it's not one thing, it's a lot of things. A and lot if they come of all at yeah. once, it, Can you imagine? I mean, I remember myself discovering how dark this was with the WEF a few years back. And I was just brought to tears. I was devastated. And I, it, it's a process of grieving. For me, it felt like grief. And yeah. I had to kind of go through the tunnel. And it was not easy because every assumption, your whole world shatters. Um, and I yeah. was already aware of 9-11, but I don't think I realized how the, the scope of this. Um, and I'm sure I've got more to learn. If I read your book, I'm sure there's a lot of silos, <laughs> a lot of rabbit holes I haven't been down. But the, the process of grieving takes a long time. It's not easy. This is an uncomfortable place to be. But yeah, I think and I think, mm -hmm. I think everyone has to go through that. It's, um, it's a process, not an event, number one. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're touching on there is uh, the five stages of grief from Kubler-Ross, of course, which is denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people are going to get trapped in that depression. Um, what I'd say to people is you can't avoid it and you shouldn't avoid it. Um, we live on a planet that's heavily water, as are we. In esoteric terms, uh, water is emotions. And so we're here to learn about them and experience them. And what you don't want to do, in my humble opinion, is try and hide from them. Um, I think there was a book, Chooses with Mori, where this came up as a point, which was just let those emotions wash through you. Don't mm -hmm. hold on to them, but experience them, wash through them. And when you're ready, then you can get on uh, with the acceptance part, which is when you go, right, what the hell are we going to do about all this? Exactly. The, get the action plan happening. Yeah. Um, which is far more productive. Okay, so point number two, and it, I hope you don't mind me interrupting you to kind Not of at all. guess a little bit because there's a lot to unpack here. Okay, go no, ahead. No problem. It's your podcast. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> so point two. Uh, you win by not winning. If your aim is to convince the other person of your position, you've already lost before you've opened your mouth. Why? Because you've got the wrong objective. A good objective could be to get them just to ask you a question, for example, or keep them out of defensive mode. Defensive mode for me is any body language signs like folded arms or a frown showing you that, um, you know, uh, they're losing interest. We'll get to that in a bit. But uh, so if your aim is to convince the other person of your position, you've already lost before you open your mouth. And that's the thing that most people struggle to get their head around. So share with me some practical examples of this the, the way not to proceed and the way to proceed on the same okay time. so um the main thing is number one you're gonna hopefully this is generally people you know mm -hmm. so you've already got a little bit of in because you know uh who they are what their politics are what their value system is and if you don't you need to get a good handle of that before you open your mouth Mm -hmm. I think there's some advice that until you're familiar with who it is you're speaking to, you shouldn't be presenting any evidence anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, what you're looking for is an opening or a chink, I would say, where maybe something's happened to that individual or they have a particular area of interest where something hasn't gone quite as the way it should. And you can always ask uh, open questions because uh, that's one of the other points on the list. A question opens the mind, a statement closes it. So it can be as much as, well, you know, world's gone a bit crazy, hasn't it? What do you think's going on? And yeah, that's a good sort of litmus test to see where that person is on the scale. 
uh, because people slide, this is another point, people slide from A to Z, they don't jump from A to Z. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that in a, a minute. But what you're trying to do, I would say, is uh, get them to keep actively listening. And the best way is to get them to ask you a question because people who are not asking questions, uh, well, you can't give solutions to people not asking questions. So stage one, get them to ask you a question. Okay, so let, let's just role play a little bit. So, because I, I tried this when I was in England, I was in the back of Ubers all the time. And I, that was kind of my line. I said, oh my gosh, what do you think of the craziness right now with COVID lockdowns? And we had some great conversations, but let's do a little yeah. role playing because I'm sure I could have done it better. So, um, the, okay, I'm gonna be uh, a normie <laughs> and let's go. So I, I'm a teller at a store or, or a friend or an acquaintance, let, let's, let's go with this. So you- Okay, but if, if you're a- if you're a teller, I don't know anything about you. And therefore, um, I've got to find out where your head's at with regard to this stuff. So we could say, yeah, okay. Hey, Will seems to have gone crazy, hasn't it, at the moment? What do you think is going on? Yeah, I don't understand what's going on. It it has gone crazy. What? Oh, excuse me. I've just got someone here knocking. No problem. <laughs> I've got a fellow working right out my window. Okay. Um, so, okay. So I agree with you. Then, then what do you say? So I, I've well, said, I'm going to have a general conversation with you because um, I still don't know a lot about who you are, what your value system yeah. and that type of thing. Yeah. So I actually don't think that um that situation, even as a setup, is the best one for engaging with people. Yeah. Just don't forget as well, 10 to 20% of people will be unreachable. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter what you tell them, how you approach it, they're not going to uh, be open to this. Right. So you need to work out whether you've got an 80 percenter. I mean, maybe um, I'll give you a very short, ex I'll, I'll give two practical examples from the book. Okay. One's a longer one about 9-11, but let me give you the really short one. Okay. Um, I was chatting, I think it was about 9-11, and I said to my friend, I believe that's the truth of the matter. And he turned around and said, that's your truth, not the truth. So what's my response to that? Silence. Nothing, nada. Why? because the guy's already entered combat mode. Yeah. And when they're in combat mode, you might as well be speaking Swahili to a non-Swahili speaking person. They mm -hmm. ain't listening to you. It doesn't matter what you say, it's not happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I went away thinking, okay, my ego demanded that I retaliate. I chose not to, because I know at that point in time, we're going to have the backfire effect. Yeah. So effectively, I've let them win the argument as mm -hmm. such. Now, what's interesting is two months later, I went back to my friend and said, look, I pretty much finished the manuscript. I know you pretty much agree with the official um, story when it comes to 9-11. Uh, I don't want to just be singing to the choir, preaching to the choir. So uh, would you mind look, taking a look at the manuscript and critiquing it for me? And he said, yeah, and about 9-11, um, yeah, I think I might change my mind on that. <laughs> yeah. So wow. by not winning the argument, the person's maybe gone away and gone, ooh, maybe I was a little over the top there. And because I haven't reacted, he's gone away and done some research for himself. And this is the key. People need to discover some information for themselves you can't force feed it. Mm. And so by that was my shortest and best example of you win by not winning. I lost the argument. I chose to lose the argument. And by doing so, I shifted uh, the person. Now, I didn't know that was going to happen. I just noticed that it did in hindsight and went, ah, maybe that's a great technique for getting people to engage. Mm -hmm. 
Very, so that's where very I came interesting. Up that you with, know, you and, win by not winning. You win by not winning. That's a great example. So be prepared to walk away, and be prepared to lose. It's okay because I think you're right. You have to catch people in that inquisitive mode. Oh, excuse me, one second. There seems to be one moment. You're popular today. <laughs> Someone else now is using a, a weak meter. Yeah, we've got some people working here. So I don't know if you can hear that in the background, but I sure can. Okay, no, I can't. So, okay. uh, so that I, I think either. that that is a really, really important reminder. Okay, so that's number two. Number three is you seed, not succeed. So seeding an idea is like seeding uh, a tree via an apple pip. Yeah, You wouldn't expect to go out one night, place the pip in the ground, and then see a fully grown tree the next day. So why, oh, why are you expecting people to change their uh, positions overnight? They're not going to do it. Why? Because these are the two factors we generally forget. You're missing absorption and processing time. They need to take on board the new information, think about that information, process it, and then maybe change their position. They're not going to do it on a dime. And once you understand that there's a time factor involved in these discussions rather than just an evidence factor, then it's easier to walk away and yeah do that as a technique which is just to try and plant a seed and let that germinate within them mm -hmm. that's interesting i had an experience um we on uh, i'm sure you're aware of the very east coast of canada newfoundland the vast majority of people in newfoundland are very asleep and i'm not quite sure what the dynamics are in that province but um so i met this lovely couple from Newfoundland in Costa Rica on vacation and we got chatting and yeah. we were the first people that they had ever met my husband and I who were not vaccinated and when they it was like we were from Mars and the gal said to me oh, you're not vaccinated that's incredible and then she started to cry because I think it kind of hit her that, uh-oh, why is she vaccinated? She'd never been vaccinated before. So we shared some time with them over a couple of weeks. But I know it was overload. But we talked about all sorts of things. Then we bumped into them a year later. And she said, I went home. And I had to fact check everything that you said. I had to process and deal with all of this and then get a therapist but the long <laughs> he came back a year later looking a million dollars um okay. with a very calm demeanor had, had kind of reconciled in her mind what was going on the bigger picture but it was a process and it was a year long process for her yeah and there was such a transformation in her uh and i it was a reminder to me that we do expect people to um, have the conversion moment right in front of us, but yeah. it's a process and it's a long one. And let, you know, let's not be impatient. So that was a really interesting, um, one of the few successes I've had actually that I, you know, that I've kind of seen it full circle a year later to have her come back and realize she really has woken up. Yeah. You're lucky to get that feedback mm -hmm. really, because you may not have bumped into it, but that's right. Um, yeah, a couple of things in addition to that. I think, yeah, uh, for some people, if their own, um, even if they are aware, it, it can be quite lonely for them because they haven't got many speak people to speak to. If you're surrounded by people who are not aware of what's really going on, uh, it can be deeply frustrating, but also isolating. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's without the government trying to uh, keep you indoors. Um, the other thing I'd say on that as well is, yeah, where do you go to fact check your information? Because the last place you want to go is the fact checking sites, because guess what? Most of them are lying through their teeth. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's another hurdle most people don't understand. I mean, so many times you go, oh, but I uh, on here it said blah, blah, blah. I'm like, have you looked who's funding them? Yeah. Go for a so deep dive on that. When I when I have had 
chit chats with people here in Costa Rica from England, I always mention UK column or Off yeah. Guardian um, as great resources for really good information. I tend to try to mention them because I agree. If you go on Google and start fact checking, you know, you're going to be completely, um, yeah, uh, confused. Uh, so I think it's really important. Well, you won't be confused. You'll just think that the official narrative is completely true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the problem. That's I right. I mean, they do mix some truth with lies just to make it less so. But, mm -hmm. yeah, the majority of the time uh, they're not, and therefore they're a really bad resource to uh, uh, go to. So the next point, number four, I think we're at. Uh, well, we covered that with the absorption and processing time. Oh, okay. Okay, yes. So five oh. now is, um, yeah, we've already touched on this before with our discussion about emotions and the fact you just want to let them really wash over you. Um, so... If, for example, if you're ringing a friend, quite often if some of these conversations come up, they're going to regurgitate everything they think they know about what's going over you and often do it in quite a vitriolic manner. If you know that's coming, then uh, what you can do is just shut up and let them get all of that energy out. So um, I think this dips into, I think it was Edward de Bono's red hat technique. And I think he got, the example was he got meetings at Shell down from 150 days to three days, which is quite a dramatic change. And what he realized was uh, the red hat was the emotions hat. And he said, right, the red hat's on the table. Everyone want, gets a say, on how they feel about what's going on at the moment. And because people had actually, A, got it out, and B, feel like they were heard, they then didn't keep bringing it up again and interrupting with all the other points. So I think you need to understand that um, emotion is quite a big thing with us humans, and that if you know that, generally speaking, there's going to be this diatribe at you to begin with. You can just sit there, absorb it all, don't react at all, and only when they've completely finished can you then come back with anything. So the idea is let the uh, sort of wash out, wash through you without reacting. Mm. That's a very good tip. Let them exhaust themselves with yes. <laughs> That's a better word, exhausted. Yeah, exhaust them first. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right. Once they feel like they've got it all out and they're fully heard, they may be more receptive to uh, an interesting question, a probing question. or a... Then it's time to ask a question, yeah, and mm -hmm. see, or get them to ask a, uh, you a question if you can, yeah. Okay, so the next point is something very simple, is uh, if you sat there or say someone comes out with something inflammatory that you totally disagree with, okay, don't say you disagree with that. Just say, is that so? So technique from sort of Zen philosophy, is that so? You know, you're not agreeing or disagreeing, but what it does is keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. Because they haven't exhausted themselves yet, to your point. Okay. So you're really, you're trying to draw out as much um, angst that they might Venom. <laughs> draw out the venom. Yeah. that That's a great line. Is that so? Because it is entirely neutral. And yeah. yet it does elicit, tell me more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, good one. I've got to get that one in the repertoire. Yeah. So the next one we've covered, which is ask questions, not statements don't make statements um yeah uh, we also touched on number eight which was allow people to discover some of the information for themselves you know, you don't have to tell them everything about something you just have to give them a tidbit um now a really important one is the fact 
we've mentioned it before, but not in detail, so we're diving a bit more now, is people slide from A to Z, they don't jump from A to Z. So this is where, again, you're assessing who it is you're dealing with. So if the person you're speaking to is someone who clearly thinks the government hasn't lied to them ever, they're at A. There is no point in talking about some of the darker agendas, satanic ritual abuse or anything else, because they will look at you like you got three heads. Yeah? <laughs> Understand it's a scale. They need to slide along that scale. So it's a bit like a breadcrumb trail. You put the first bit of bread in front of them and let them hop there. Once they're at B, then you can show them C. Once they're at C, D, D, E. As soon as you start jumping at any point on that scale, you're going to lose them. So tell me, in a practical terms, this almost hierarchy of items or topics that you could be bringing up. Can you share with me what are the most rudimentary or elementary concepts to be throwing out there? Because there is, there is a hierarchy, there is a gradient of things. Some are more palatable than others. Well, there is, but I don't particularly want to give you one because, A, I've never formally sat down and gone, OK, what is A and what's at Z? I mean, there are a few mems out there that have sort of got that on there mm. because I think it's missing the point is I'm giving the principle, but A for one person may not be A for another person. Yeah. And therefore, you have to understand what their A and Bs are. Mm -hmm. There isn't just some set formula where you go, well, if you do that, do that, do that. So these are techniques that work, but it's up to you to apply the nuance to those with the situation in front of you. Right. Does that make sense? Really know your audience. And I guess yeah. you're right. For someone in the financial world, they may have an awareness that there's heavy manipulation going on or CBDs coming out. Whereas, you know, a nurse may be thinking, hmm, what happened to my body, my choice? Yeah, you're, yeah. you're right. It's very nuanced. And so, yeah, so A, yeah, CBDCs could be A for someone who's in finance and aware of all that and yeah. wouldn't be A for someone else. So, yeah, this is why I haven't gone to a formulate list. I mean, yeah. you could do something along that line, but I think it draws people in the wrong direction. To yeah. Just give one out. So I, there is, I mean, what I did get off the internet, which I think really a um, couple of sentences that sums up this whole process is um, everyone needs to stop trying to red pill people in a coma. I've been pink pilling people. Uh, I take one small truth and show it to them. Then let them think about that. That's your absorption and processing time. Then they will start asking questions. Then I will show them another and it is working. So find the little truth and nugget that interests them. Once you've asked you a question, then they're open to receiving an answer. If they haven't asked you a question, you're force feeding them and it doesn't work. I like that. I like the pink pill concept and less is better. Yeah. And we don't do that generally. We think we need to do more. And when they're still not listening, we want to give them even more. <gasps> and that, and this is where it doesn't work. So I know these techniques work really well because I've given them to people and they've come back and said, my success rate in communicating with my friends has gone exponential. I mean, there was one very nice bit of feedback. I mean, I don't know if it was particularly about the techniques, but it was about the book. Um, the last three years, he said, me and my brother haven't been able to have a conversation for more than two minutes without it turning into a complete and utter slanging match. He said, after, you re after he'd read your book, we can now have a conversation for hours again without that happening. So in your book, 180 Degrees, do you talk about these concepts? Yeah, what we've just been through now, yeah. Yeah, end of chapter four has most of these 
in there. I mean, a couple I've refined, a couple are in other parts of the book. So okay. uh, this is them all together. But most of those, yeah. Are in, all in, in, in your chapter four, which you call countermeasures. Now, here's a classic example. I have no idea. You say anti-comatose, lessons in anatomy, the hunt, mind patrol, to kill a mockingbird, and the trim tab experiment. So essentially in chapter four, although I can't delineate from those titles what you're talking about, this is what you're talking about, kind of this strategy to pink pill people. Yeah, that's at the end of the chapter. Prior to that, I'm uh, the hunt, for example, is talking about other potential false flag events. And rather than me say, okay, uh, these were or they weren't, I call it the hunt and go, right, I've given you all the precursors and how these things work. What do you think about situation A, B and C? And just give various quotes and pieces of information that link back to, um, say, the 20 points. Right. And I think that's how I've tried to approach the whole book, which is not um, force feed people or give my opinion but let them come to the conclusion themselves mm. very interesting yes in my normie days i was looking <laughs> at working with the bill and melinda gates foundation because i was in vancouver there that's in kirkland seattle area mm -hmm. and one of my friends said hmm i don't know if you want to be working with them go for a deep dive on bill gates and what happened in kenya and she said nothing more well, of course, as soon as I got home, I went yeah. to dive and realized that they had sterilized a million Kenyan women uh, through a vaccine program there. And I was horrified, but she knew this, but said nothing. She let it be my um, experience or my investigation. Yeah, yeah, brilliant but technique. It was brilliant. She's, she's, it was brilliant. she's all over it, nothing. yeah. Yeah, but I was so curious to know what she was talking about that, of course, I went. Um, and that's something... Maybe Did you also life. discover the 400, was it 70, 91,000 paralyzed children? No. Excuse me? What are you referring to? Uh, this was uh, one of the Gates vaccines, and they did a study and reckoned the excess uh, kids that were paralyzed over a 20-year period came in, at, I think, 491,000. I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's about that in the book. Oh, my goodness. No, it gets worse. It's so evil. So on that topic, the ringleaders, who in your mind are the ringleaders? <laughs> who is you want the, names? I know that's a big question, but who is behind the veil? Do you want the names? Yeah. OK, so uh, when I get asked this one, it's like, OK, because um, <clears throat> you can't know all of them and it's mm -hmm. like any hierarchy you need to keep moving up to get to the top uh i often refer to um and quote in the book uh red symphony which was um a book uh well the transcript was taken in 1938 i don't think the book itself came out to the uh maybe the 1960s but in that there was um an ambassador of France being interrogated by one of Stalin's henchmen. And I'd really recommend everyone read it. It's almost like a pamphlet. It's only 55 pages long, but it's a very interesting take on how the world works. And the guy who was being interviewed uh, was speaking French. So they needed it translating the guy, um, was only meant to make two copies. He took a third one and kept it, is how the story goes. Now, in that, he said um, he only names two people specifically, which is Lionel Rothschild and Walter Rathenau. Excuse me? The, the, the second name? Walter Rathenau. Okay, that's a new one for me. Yeah, and then he goes on to list a load of family names, so not individuals, but families, he said, were also part of this. And that included some you might be familiar with, like Baruch, Milner, Schiff and Warburg. So some of those from Council of Foreign Relations and uh, Federal Reserve setup. 
as well as a load of less familiar ones such as Frankfurter, Altschul, Cohen, Strauss, Steinhardt, Blom, Rosenman, Dreyfus, Ezekiel and Lasky. And then you've probably got to add in all the names that were listed by Fritz Springmeier in Bloodlines of the Illuminati. And there you've got uh, a couple of familiar ones, Rockefeller, Rothschild, also Astor, Bundy, Collins, Dupont, Freeman, Kennedy, Lai, Merovingian, Anassis, Russell, Van Dun, Disney, Reynolds, MacDonald and Krupps. In addition to those, we also have Orsini, Breakspear, Aldra Brandini, Farnese, uh, Somagalia, Pallavicini, Medici, Gitani, Pamphili, Este, Borgia, Conti, Chigi, and Colonna. And I suppose we better add in the Saxe Coburgs as well. So there's about 48 of them, or I don't know how many there were there, but I'd say start there and work your way upwards. So some of the institutions like the Vatican, the Catholic yeah. Church, um, even within the Christian circle, uh, within the Jewish circle, within the Muslim circle, there's got to be a lot of leaders or key people in those circles as well, right? Well, the point is that uh, if you take something like the Catholic Church, I mean, we can go back 2,000 years with this discussion. We can also go to Emperor Constantine in 325 and the Council of Nicaea. But let's just stick more recent uh, for the moment. And um, it's come from two sources. One was Bella Dodd and the other was, which confirmed it, which was more interesting, was James Jimmy Boots Rothstein, who was an NYPD um, officer in the 60s who was tasked about finding out what was going on with all the child trafficking and paedophilia. And he said within about three weeks, we'd worked out what was going on, was if you got someone at a low level, you could arrest them. And if they're at a higher level, you wouldn't be able to touch them. And so uh, both Bella Dodd said that the Catholic Church was infiltrated by 1,100 paedophiles in the 1930s in order to sort of destroy it from within. I mean... Some of the crimes go way before that. We can talk about what the Catholic Church did to the Cathars and everything else, but let's just stick with this one. Mm -hmm. So she said that was there. Now, uh, if you read a book, School of Darkness, and uh, the committee hearing she spoke at, that quote isn't in there, but a friend uh, acknowledged that she did say it. Now, where we get the corroboration is from James Jimmy Boots Rothstein, who was... Um, told go into that office, the office was empty and on there was uh, a set of documents that he was just meant to read through, not take notes and walk out. And he said there that um, that was, uh, the whole thing was a setup. He references, I think, Jesus uh, Engleton uh, from probably the OSS, which was the forerunner of the CIA. And he said, from that moment, I instantly realised it was a complete setup. And who did the setup? Basically, uh, he referenced, uh, yeah, uh, the OSS and the money changers. Hmm. So, um, you know, if you're wondering, and also in chapter eight, we touch on this, but even the Vatican's own exorcist who had the role for 25 years, said he'd met carnal, cardinals that were, uh, that were um, uh, possessed by demons. And he said, the devil resides in the Vatican. This is the Catholic Church's <laughs> chief exorcist. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Why would you disagree with that observation? So the infiltration's been going on a long time. Some would say it actually started 2,000 years ago. Uh, but I think, and here again, I need to be very clear, I'm not having a go at anyone's faith. Yeah. I try and separate in the book um, very much so the people's faith and the entities that sat on top of that faith. Uh, because I think, I think it was Cliff I saying 
a few weeks back saying if you go back to the literature from like uh three and a half thousand bc uh none of the religions existed as as proper hierarchical structures so yeah i have a problem with the financialization uh the politicization and the sexualization of those institutions and we have to understand that um psychopaths have infiltrated these institutions uh there's a whole load of blackmail going on which we can perhaps um cover as well in a minute and that that is not what is connected with the teachings as such right we need to be able to separate the two out one is faith one is a corporate entity that's been slapped on top of it. Do you think that there's any faith group that would be particularly offended when reading your book? Uh, I hope not, but I think all that depends on where they are in their awake personal awakening process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, what I've tried to do throughout the book, if we're talking about certain issues, then I'm quoting people from that category. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to discuss the infiltration of uh, the Catholic Church, yeah, I'm quoting the chief exorcist of the Catholic Church, right. not okay. someone who, say, uh, of a different faith, uh, slagging right. it off. So you're so, speaking, and yeah, you're speaking so in, just, in, in... Yeah, so you're showing that people within that uh entity i mean i quote um e michael jones in the book a couple of times um you know uh i'm thinking he's very much on top of some of this and what's going on but the important thing is your faith is not the church and the church is not your faith mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there is a quote in there that um you know when you when all this comes out and i think this could be one of the most um mentally damaging for people who have got that faith it's really important that they separate the two out yeah yeah because in a sense they're intertwined but they shouldn't be your faith should be separate from the institution of that correct religion. yes and for a lot of people they're they are too entwined and they need to extract themselves right yeah, I mean, we can go back to uh, 325 AD and the Council of Nicaea. We had Emperor Constantine, who basically went, right, all this religion stuff is basically way too decentralised. We need to bring it all together. So he brought in 20, 220 elders, all at a conference and said, right, at the end of this, we need to have one thing rather than multiple things. So, of course, you've you got a mixture of things going on. Now, some people see, oh, he was a good egg because he decriminalised Christianity. But what he also did was basically merge the state and the church. So now, if you were disobeying the state, you were disobeying God. Well, that's quite collectivist and cunning at the same time. And you can go, well, was Constantine the first a Christian? we can discuss um was he a sociopath well that's uh not for discussion because i think he had his uh first son murdered and his wife boiled alive mm -hmm. now the point i'm making is this individual a good person to be following with respect to your faith and so we also talk about some of the slightly wayward popes uh, one who actually dug up his predecessor from the ground after he died, put him in uh, the dock and berated him for three days before chopping his fingers off and throwing him in the Tiber. Question, is this the sort of person you want to take instruction from? Yes or no? So, you know, over the years, we've had multiple ebbs and flows uh, all I would say is separate the two out. Your institutions have been infiltrated and therefore just because X says something because they're wearing a special outfit doesn't automatically mean you should listen to them. Mm. Do you have any comment on the royal family? I know that they're not they're not British. They're German, right? Um, any comment on 
because I actually talked to some Brits this summer about this topic, and they had no idea that the royal family was actually of German descent. Um, I thought most Brits knew that, but apparently not. Um, but do you have any comment on the on the royal family? Um, I touch on it briefly in the book. It's not a big area. Uh, obviously, one of the key points is um, their connection with Jimmy Savile, who um, was probably one of the worst paedophiles in history. We had a CIA document uh, calling out Lord Mountbatten as a paedophile. Um, you know, and we've got uh, one of the family members over on Epstein Island as everyone's familiar with. So um, clearly there's a lot of questions to be answered. Yes. Wow. So what? why are people, um, I mean, we've got the five categories. Why are some people the strivers? Why are some people the normies? Why are some the rebels? What's your theory on why we drop into one category or another? You want my honest answer? Mm -hmm. Probably based on how many times you've been here before. Mm. And it was interesting because um, someone did a study, I think, and they were looking at who fell for the propaganda and who didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, we know IQ wasn't a, a big factor in helping you not fall for it because mm -hmm. lots of people with high IQ went along. Uh, it would appear it wasn't uh, you needed a high IQ, you needed a high EQ. It was the emotional intelligence because uh, one study showed the least likely to fall for it were those who had high um, intuition and um, empathy. Now, I would argue, um, and people don't, I have to believe it, we all have different beliefs and I'm not here to uh, diss anyone else's or force feed mine to anyone else either. But um, I would say if we are, uh, this isn't the first rodeo I've done and I've been here before, and there's lots of cases of um, supposed reincarnation which are uh, very strong, Um children six, seven years old who remember themselves as a Japanese fighter, an American fighter pilot during the Second World War. And I think it was the um, University of Virginia has a department for this, and they gave the kid basically a perfect score. He was coming out with information which no one knew. They had to deeply research and only then found that he was right. So the thing for me is that if this is true, it is, i.e. the fact we're not immortal, but we are eternal. This is fascinating because, A, I don't remember, but as soon as that's a possibility, you ask yourself the question, well, what did I come back for this time? And I think there's, uh, I wonder if, um, of all those who refused, are the ones we've been here before, been through this shit show so many times when... <laughs> Hang on, I think I recognise this one. Now, I, I, I'm inclined to say that you could have um, been through a lot of experience in your life in your first time round. Maybe you've had more trauma, maybe you've had more disappointment. In my experience, the people that are quite awake have had maybe more dips in their life. Um, and the people that have had an easier life um don't seem to be as aware so do you think there's something there that maybe it's based could, on could no, be. I, I don't want I to mean, say trauma that's kind of extreme but people who have maybe not had the easiest life or they've been the black sheep in the family or they've had some knocks in life and yeah i, I mean i'd say it's it's multifactorial i don't think you can point to one thing and mm -hmm. go there you go because we're all different and it'd be a boring world if we weren't. I mm. mean, I was chatting with Tim Price about this and he said uh, some in the finance industry didn't fall it because they reckon they were quite good at detecting bullshit. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more elements to it than what I've stated, but I do think 
out of all the people I know, uh, the least likely to have got it were those with uh, high intuition and high empathy. Yeah, interesting. Intuition and empathy. I almost think there's an inverse correlation between education and um, getting the vaccine or, or getting the program as well. It seems as though people are more intuitive the less education they have. Well, yeah, again, I don't know if that's true, but I agree with your point that uh, the more educated, I think, the more compliant. I mean, I've noticed, uh, yeah, uh, I think blue collar workers were less likely to fall for it than white collar. But I think we're back to the bullshit detection again in that the dealing, I think a lot of this is... Um, in the corporate world, it's not that it doesn't happen, but a lot of it is extracted out into um, more abstract concepts. Whereas I think if you're a builder, it's pretty much in your face when someone's telling you, you know, there's less nuance and sophistication there. So maybe that's a factor as well, but um, mm. yeah, who knows? Yeah, it's fascinating because I agree. It's not, it's not intelligence, it's not education, in a sense, mind you, I'd say maybe it is the more it's it's a liability, it seems to be more educated. Um, mind you, there was kind of a bell curve of the very uneducated and the very educated uh, were the most likely to be aware. So it's kind of that middle right. ground that are more sleepy. Um, Could be, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about your book a little bit and tell me touch on like your favorite chapters this is a big book <laughs> i'll hold up so people can see this is a thick one <laughs> how many pages actually you, you probably know seven seven hundred and something pages yeah well there's basically 800, 800. Uh, the numbers only go to uh, actually end on 777 which is interesting oh. because that was accidental but uh People can look up the significance of that uh, because <laughs> yeah. the first 20 uh, first twenty pages are in Roman numerals. So you have to add 20 oh, okay. on to the seven, add seven, those. seven. So that gets you to 797 with a couple of blanks. So, so yeah, so I, what, I say it's 800 pages. So it's eight, say 800. So what? just touch on the topics that you're addressing here. What are the conspiracies? Because unlearn the lies you've been taught to believe. Are you addressing in the book the big lies, the Vietnam War, for instance, World War One, World War Two. What are the conspiracies, or what do you discuss in this book? Um, I mean, I touch very briefly on the uh, Vietnam War, basically in terms of the Gulf and Tonkin incident and the fact that that was made up. It never happened, and they use that as a prerequisite for starting the Vietnam War. I think a million and a half people died off the back of that, 58,000 American soldiers, all for an incident that didn't happen. Uh, we also cover um, other things. I don't go into World War One as such, but we do cover very briefly in Chapter 1 the Lusitania, for example, and also Pearl Harbor. Um, that's sort of the warm-up to 9-11 uh, because the more historic examples and people tend to be less emotionally attached to those examples and therefore the an easier introduction, I think. So it's not that the Lusitania and Pearl Harbor were uh, out and out right false flags as such. I call them sort of hybrid operations. So, for example, um, the Lusitania was um, filled with uh, guns and ammunition on a passenger vessel which was uh, against international law. It was sailed into an area where there was a known U-boat, it was slowed down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they were trying, uh, we were trying our hardest to make sure the Germans sank it. Why? Because they wanted a flame of indignation to uh, flow through America, and that would encourage them to come into World War I. With Pearl Harbor, um, again, it's clear who the perpetrators were, but what most people don't know is the fact that um, the American government knew well in advance what was happening. I believe it was Robert Stinnett who 
uncovered some documentation showing that they'd actually broken all the Japanese cipher codes. And 12 days before Pearl Harbor, uh, they de uh, deciphered one saying, we're going to deal uh, a mortal blow to America in Hawaii. So uh, there was also uh, a lady who heard a story from a father who was in the Red Cross who went in to see the president. And he said, get ready for uh, multiple casualties in Hawaii. Uh, and when uh, the gentleman from the Red Cross protested at this and said, why, what's happening? He said, um, basically, we can't go to war until uh, the American people have been attacked on their own soil. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you add in the British side of this as well, um, I think they were trying to embargo Japan and basically force Japan into acting. So the, the story as we've been told, which is they randomly come along and attack Hawaii and no one knew anything about it, um, well, that's not the real story. Very interesting. Boy, it would have required a lot of research to write this book because I'm sure you're documenting your sources. Yeah, there's over a thousand citations in the book. Um, pretty much um, nearly all of them have that. The the couple, the few I don't, uh, a lot of those I actually transcribed myself, but couldn't find the original source because on social media and stuff like that, you can't always uh, find it. So, um, yeah, the point with all that is people can go and research for themselves. Again, mm -hmm. I don't want it to be uh, my opinion. I'm trying to just lay out an alternative perspective that people can uh, research for themselves. Excellent. Now, what was the toughest chapter for you to write? What was the topic? Probably chapter eight was the toughest, but only because there were a lot of uh, disparate elements within it. And so knitting them and weaving them all together uh, probably proved the hardest because some of the chapters like 9-11, you know, you've already... Um, Put your boundaries on that it's quite easy whereas with chapter eight we're looking at ancient history the pyramids freemasonry uh the church and religion and um theory of evolution and things like that mm -hmm. ah interesting so you talk about evolution um what about what was the darkest chapter in terms of depressing for you to maybe be focusing on I mean obviously you wanted to write about it but was there one in particular that was hard material? yeah so the chapter most people will struggle with is chapter nine because that's where we're dealing with uh, a lot of the child trafficking the paedophilia the MK Ultra, and everything surrounding that and uh, trying to um, you know lead people in in a way where they can understand what's really going on. Uh, there's an excerpt from a 12 minute conversation is much wider conversation with uh, banker Ronald Bernard. And for example, he gave the, uh, he said he was uh, invited to attend the church of Satan. And he was also um, asked to uh, fly abroad and sacrifice a child. And this is the type of thing that's going on in order to get into the higher echelons. And if you don't do this type of thing, you can't get up there. And this is where um, I say to people, you know, unless you've got a psychopath mitigation strategy, you don't have a strategy uh, because blackmail is um, front and central of how our system really works. Talk and yet about it's... Yeah, talk about that a little bit more because we, you know, blackmail, I would agree, is very central to what's going on. Describe what you see. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's give an example. So uh, Jennifer Nakuri was a former partner of Boris Johnson, the ex prime minister in the UK. Uh, she said um, something like the following You can. Uh, believe me now or find out later, that man Boris was compromised and blackmailed before he entered office. 
So, it, you know, we're going through what is, with voting, what is a mock ritual, because it doesn't matter. You know, it's um, what's in their control file is what's driving their decision making, not um, doing the right thing or what's in the best interest of the population. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's plenty of other examples. I mean, uh, Ted Gunderson, who was a former head of the FBI in Los Angeles division, so one of the biggest ones there, um, he said, why is no one investigating the child trafficking operation run by the CIA? So the intel agencies are part of the problem. And so that brings us to things like uh, Epstein Island and everything else. But this is being done, unfortunately, now, I believe, on an industrial scale. And it's one, I think it's going to be the hardest for us to deal with when the full truth comes out. Mm -hmm. I, I met this summer a gentleman who was with the Canadian military, and he said, I've killed so many people, but never on Canadian soil. And that kind of got my attention. And I was like, oh, please explain. Right. And as it turns out, he said, when I was in the Canadian military, we came across these sex trafficking units in Central America all the time, run by the U.S. military and the CIA. And they would yeah. murder them, cold-blooded murder. But they never got charged because he said that they didn't want to raise attention to this dark bit of business going on. And But they killed so many people. He killed so many people. And I thought, oh, my gosh. Like, then the, the sex trafficking... Um, issue to me is is a relatively new one i was not aware of the scope of it and um but he he talked about this in such a i don't want to say laissez-faire but you know this is 20 30 years ago right he was down in central america and witnessing all of this but it was the yeah well a lot of those cia officers offices were basically run on uh basically they had to be profitable yeah. It didn't matter what you got up to. You just had to get the funds flowing through. Yeah. I mean, but it's not only in the child trafficking area. I mean, Andrew Bridgen, I think you had on the other week, didn't you? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, he came out public and said, uh, they, as in number 10, tried to bribe me. Uh, they said, what do you want? You can have anything you want in order to uh, shut up about uh, the vaccine injuries. So... I don't think when you hear this and um, such like, it's like, well, none of your um, representatives are representing you. No. You know, and I think this is the point more and more people are becoming aware of now. Um, I mean, I give an example in the buckle going back to 2004 with the States and um but I forgot his full name, the Curtis someone, I think. Oh, Eugene Curtis, sorry, I believe. He was um, asked by a judge about, um, yeah, flipping the vote in the elections. And he said, yeah, I'd been tasked with uh, writing a software programme, which I did, which should flip the vote 5149. And the judge said, well, would anyone be able to tell, you know, this had been done? He said, no one would see it. Someone else looked at how the whole American electronic voting system works and said, this is exactly how you'd set it up if you wanted to um, have a centralised file which you could access and play around with. I, if I want to mess around with the elections, this setup is exactly how I'd want it to be. So in America, you, you haven't had free and fair elections since at least 2000. And of course, what's the uh, a lot of the machines called Dominion? Because they always like to tell you what they're doing. So we're going to hold Dominion over you. So yeah, I I just think it's uh, voting's a zero impact human ritual uh, that we all need to get out of. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of the suffragettes and everything be turning in the grave. But um, unless you're on a paper system which at least we still are in the uk at least they can't mess around with the vote so easily but it doesn't matter anyway because 
to get into power, you have to have a control file on you. And the higher up you go, I believe, the darker that file is. And then who are you listening to? Uh, your constituents or someone who's going to threaten exposing you? Um, I mean, there's... I don't have got it here. Um, let me just see. No, um, there's a there's a quote in the book. Basically, uh, I think one's from Dave Jander. Um, uh, let me see if I can recall the story. Uh, he was uh, in part of the Reagan administration in the eighties. And he said, I was given some advice, which was basically don't go to, um, if you're invited to a party in Washington, D.C., don't go. I said, why not? He said, yeah, uh, you can go there, uh, but there'll be drinks. It'll be for a football game. It might be at the uh, senator's house. But Dave, uh, they'll slip something. There'll be kids walking around. They'll slip something in your drink and you'll wake up with a Polaroid photo on your chest and they've got you, you know. I mean, there's much worse examples than that, but those are the type of um, problems we need to be open about and address if we're ever going to change the system. So you wrote this book in 21. Uh, do you touch on, I mean, there's so many things that have happened since then. Uh, it was finished in 2020, actually. Oh, okay. So what topics would you love if you were to write a few more chapters to tuck into this book? What would you be writing uh, about now? Well, I did touch on the fake alien invasion uh, right in Chapter 14, which is probably what's next up in the not-too-distant future. Yeah, uh, I, oh, I'm, I missed that. What did you say again? You missed... The, the fake alien invasion. Yes, yes, okay. <laughs> so we, we, we've all got the popcorn waiting for that one to turn up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I think someone said, yeah, wait, for them to pull it and wait for the real ones to jump in the middle of it and they go hang on what's going on up there then that isn't quite part of the plan who knows uh maybe i'd probably have a section on ukraine but um with all these things i think lots of things come and go uh the main point is to include those examples where you can really take um learn a lot of lessons from so there's two chapters on the banking system. Uh, there's one called American Gulag, which covers what we just talked about there with the um, the voting systems and everything else, the gender agenda and things like that. Um, yeah, so, I mean, watch this space, probably uh, there'll be a new current thing next week, Marianne. Sorry? There'll be a new current thing next, next week. week. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, whatever it is. Whatever it is. So, what's your take on Ukraine and Russia? I can guess, but let's hear you tell me. I'm not sure if you're going to guess correctly. Um, okay. Well, I think with all these things, um, once you understand, a, it's never about one objective, about stacked objectives, and. These people tend to work on five or six levels deep. Mm -hmm. So if you're at level one and you've discovered level two, it's very unlikely that that's going to be the full story. Because if you can do this five or six levels deep, uh, then the chances of your real motivations being discovered uh, are unlikely. So... I mean, at level one in the newspapers, it's kindergarten stuff, you know. Um, I mean, America, it's orange man good, orange man bad. Uh, over in Russia, is Putin is evil. Like, yeah, not very interesting. Level two, as we found out, uh, we go back to things like the Minsk agreement and the fact that NATO shouldn't have been coming up to Russian borders and completely ignored it. Uh, we have other levels which then are coming out now with regard to Hunter Biden's laptop. And then we're into uh, back to the child trafficking, bribery, and um, that type of thing. Uh, then we've got the bio labs, 
which of course I think took six days to debunk. Normally it's maybe six months, but we're all getting better at this. But originally said, no, no, we don't have any over there. Oh, yeah, we might have them over there, but, you know, we're not doing anything nefarious. Well, it could be deemed that way, but, you know. And it, so by day six, I think Victoria Newland had admitted that, yes, and it was on the American-Ukraine embassy, that, yes, they had heavily invested in biolabs. Now, if you've been following someone like investigative journalist George Webb, He'd been telling you all the details of that five years ago. Where's our meat? Okay, who is that journalist, George Webb? George Webb. He's an investigative uh, researcher. Uh, you can pick him up on uh, Twitter. Uh, but, yeah, he did a five-year deep dive into the whole Ukraine side of things. But I don't think we've even really got to um, what's really going on there, which is one, ethnic cleansing. And below that, you've got, and this was a random one, but I do think it um, heads towards uh, a possibility. There was a gentleman busy renaming a lot of um, Ukrainian cities uh, with names like Holy Jerusalem. So I believe at the bottom of um, the levels with Ukraine, is they're trying to move Israel to Ukraine. With the rebuilding, um, you know, once you've destroyed it, you then get all the uh, pe other people to pay for rebuilding it, and then you move the um, gas pipeline that they've been trying to get through Syria and failing up through uh, the Black Sea. Okay, this is interesting. You've Did taken, you guess that one? You've taken it to a whole new level that I <laughs> heard. Wow. Now, yeah. I'm not saying that's definitely the case, mm -hmm. but it would seem to fit um, some of what's going on. And with all these things, you can only speculate um, and draw some of the dots together. But I think um, there's a strong possibility that that is the case. Fascinating. Well, what fits with that a little bit is something I read yesterday that they're they're mandating vaccines for all Ukrainians starting October 1st. Yeah. That that that's pretty serious. Well, it's, they, they wouldn't be the only ones, though, would they? No, but at this point in time, when everyone is saying, you know, in a lot of countries, England, there, there, there's, you know, the U.S., there's no uptake for new vaccines right now. No one's interested. And then you hear that they're mandating them in Ukraine for everyone. It's like, what? That, that That's certainly not what's happening in the rest of the world at this point in time. No, I mean, one of the problems with all this is... Um, is it's why in the book, um, I talk about a more interested in breaking the lie than proving the truth. Because the lie is a much lower barrier to address. Mm. Quite often it can be almost impossible to get to the absolute truth when you're floating in a sea of lies. Mm -hmm. But in order to break the spell that have been cast over people, I think... Um, the first hurdle is break the lie, because when they can understand they've been lied to, then they're more open to search for the truth. But, you know, we're in the fog of war. Um, anyone who tells you they know exactly what's going on is lying. And uh, until we get to some more solid ground and a lot of what's gone on really comes out, uh, however that's going to happen um, over time, I don't think we can, um, we need to be able to build on a foundation of stone, not a foundation of sand. And the lies are the foundation of sand. So fascinating what your take on Ukraine is. What about Russia and China? And, and how, what, what's, your <laughs> take, what's your take uh, on all of this? Marianne, how long have we got? 
Well, give me give me your Reader's Digest because it seems to me like you've got your finger on the pulse. You're thinking outside the box and you've done tremendous amount of research. So I'm intrigued. Well, China, you've got a view uh, more, uh, you know, the regime is communist. It's, and it's communist first, it's Chinese second, not Chinese first, communist second. And when you understand that, and also I do make the point in the book um, that, you know, the East-West um, split is a bit like the left-right split and the uni party. I mean, how true this is, but I remember a quote from uh, Bill Cooper, and he said there used to be submarines meet under the Arctic every Christmas to pass over the script for the next year between the East and West of what's going on. So I think all these um, sides are there. doesn't matter which one you take as long as you take one. Mm -hmm. But what only matters really is the vertical, which is are we getting more freedom or are we taking or having it taken away? And all the rest is just a distraction. So I think with China, um, I mean, they came to power from the 70s, I think. Rockefeller went over in the 70s with or uh, they invited 350 uh, dignitaries over and said, we're going to pass the baton over to China. Yeah. So all the manufacturing we're going to send to you as part of a way of um, weakening the US. And so when you understand that was a strategy, all these decisions have been made at a supranational level. So to talk about countries, yes, there's national interests. Yes, particularly with the Chinese, they're very keen um, on having one country, one culture, as it were, which is why they're so interested in Taiwan and things like that. But I think we've got to get to the point where via secret societies or whatever mechanism, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, that these decisions are not being made on a national basis. So to speak purely in nation state terms, I think you're somewhat missing the point. Does that uh, really all of this way? all of this east versus west is all theater it certainly was during the 20th century now we can go into a deep dive but i'm not going to do it uh with russia putin and everything else because this is the key for me uh i mean i'll just refer you to edgar casey's uh prophecy i think he said that uh Russia may be uh, key in the survival of humanity. Oh, so you think Russia might be a goodie, not a baddie, or, or it's broken off from the agenda? Well, this is the big question. That's a big has question. It, has it or I hasn't struggled. it? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think both, uh, both possibilities are still in play. Mm -hmm. there, it's... it's um, they're contradictory. Russia, on one hand, is doing a lot of unusual, interesting things in terms of incentivizing large families. Um, apparently, their vaccine is not nearly as toxic as the West. Um, they are they they're respecting tradition and religion and faith and honoring the family, but. On the other hand, they're fast tracking central bank digital currencies. They're yeah. at the forefront of surveillance. So, uh, you know, and then is the Sputnik better? I've heard reports that it's much safer. The only people apparently that are dying of the vaccine in Russia are the people that left the country to get it and didn't get the Sputnik. So I'm hearing so many mixed reports out of Russia. I'm not quite sure what to think. Hmm. Well, as I say, I think both possibilities are still in play. There's no doubt that Putin's a nationalist. Uh, that absolutely definitely don't need to argue over. Um, but, you know, there's so many more elements to this. But what you can say with absolute truth, if it's in our newspapers and mainstream media, you can pretty much dismiss it because it's probably a lie. 
Yeah. And if it's not in the mainstream media, it's the lie through omission, omission. And that's what George Orwell said was the greatest form of the lie. So, so you, it's plausible in your mind that Russia may have been going along and now has defected from this globalist plan? It's possible, but I wouldn't put any money on it. So what key, what do we need to watch for? What do you think is key um, to ascertain what is really going on? There's so much stuff that needs to come out. I don't know if I could say A is the thing that's going to absolutely show you. Mm -hmm. um, let's see what uh, goes on in the next six months. What are I you? So let me just ask you predictions. Give me some predictions. Because we're Why? in a kind of volatile <laughs> time here. Uh, you've got your crystal ball. <laughs> How have I? Okay. What do you think is coming down the pipe? Well, I'll give you one little snippet. I gave a talk up in Forres uh, near Inverness in Scotland. And at the end of that, a gentleman whose retired military intelligence came up for a quick conversation. Seemed very friendly. Again, I mean, just because, you know, he's retired doesn't mean to say he's going to tell you the whole truth. But he was chatting about where he'd been, and he'd been into 100 countries, including the Arctic and Antarctica. And I said, now this immediately got my attention. I said, oh, Antarctica. I said, did you meet any ETs while you were down there? His response was, you know that not only in Antarctica, right? Hmm. Make of that what you will. But uh, do you, do you, now I'm being the skeptic. I would say he was a plant that intentionally attended your talk and came to chat with you and plant this idea. Well, I don't think he came to uh, plant that idea, but uh, good critical thinking skills, Marianne, because of course that's a possibility. And probably out of all the possibilities, you put that as number one. That would be my guess. I mean, I'm not an idiot. I realise that these things um, happen. But it's interesting when the point is, he's not the only one saying this, you know, uh, go to Dick Algar's team and the remote viewers and look at some of their work. Um, and it's one of the things I say towards the end of the book, I think, you know, how do we in the end win this battle? Uh, we all win it when we embrace our own innate psychic ability and tap in because uh, if we all do that, we can't be lied to anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they've got multiple cases where three or four of them all remote viewing a target. They're only given uh, an alphanumeric number and the quality and detail they come out with is fantastic. Yeah. And so one of the things towards the end was talking about, uh, for example, the moon landings and what was going on there. But um, Daz Smith said, um, I think there's been over 40 remote, you know, quality remote viewers all found bases on the dark side of the moon. Now, what did Carl, I think it was Carl Wolf, was it? Uh, the guy who said... He went into an NSA facility uh, back in the day. Uh, this was when uh, it just orbited the moon and did take the pictures. He said the guy had laid these photos out in front of him. He was going, look, there's the, you know, there's like radar dishes or bases on the dark side of the moon. Bill Cooper said he had also seen those photos. So when you've got corroboration from two people who've already seen it, and you've got the remote viewers and other um people coming in as well. I think this is going to be one of the most fascinating things that comes out. Now, again, do I know exactly what's going on there? No, but there's enough evidence for a reasonable critical thinker to suggest uh, it ain't all as what we've been told. Hmm. See, I look at all of this alien talk with the military now being divulged, and I think this is a ploy to confuse us and to step up, ramp up our fear, 
because it really is out of our control that there's aliens that are coming in. So to me, that is a true um, hoax. But well, I, yeah, you know, no, but, but you know the, what? I'm a skeptic on this one just because I I don't believe there are alien in, aliens, but it and it seems very coincidental that they're stepping up all these confessions of military characters coming forward saying, Well, on that hey, I no. completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. So in order to make um a threat real, you first need to make it credible. Mm -hmm. So they've spent 70 to 80 years ridiculing everyone and killing people off for people who've brought this stuff up. Now suddenly it's fully accepted and they've done a 180 and gone, oh, yeah, the, the, this is happening. It's like, hang on a second. Hang on. What about the last 70, 80 years where you said it wasn't? So, I mean, good sources for this, if anyone's interested, you can go to Richard Dolan. I'd highly recommend uh, Daniel Liss, who's a dark journalist, mm -hmm. who does a really deep dive into some of this stuff, and the X-Protect. But if you speak to anyone of credibility in this, they'd say, yeah, a lot of this information is there. Uh, it can't be explained any other way, but why now? Are they talking about it in this way? And why now the threat? Because it goes back to uh, Werner von Braun's statement. He said the ultimate in order to create a one world government was to have a fake alien invasion. And so if you get these people like Luis Elizondo and everyone coming on TV, they're always talking about this thing as a threat. Yeah. So, yes, you're totally right. This is all this is all the setup. But. That doesn't mean that they do or don't exist, just that this is probably the setup for their fake alien invasion version. Yeah, interesting. So I have to ask you, what was your wake up moment? Uh, my wake up moment was watching um, a video called Money is Debt by Paul Grinion, who's a Canadian, you'll be pleased to know. Hmm. And uh, prior to that, Literally, I was working 14 hour days. I was also doing my master's degree at the same time. So literally, I had no time whatsoever to look into any of this um, from probably 2004, but really 2006. Um, I saw that and I went, that can't be how our monetary system really works, does it? Which is basically printing uh, money out of thin air and charging interest on it. I was like, that's what got me engaged in a really few years then into the financial system and how all that works. And of course, once you touch on the finance system, you're pretty much into every other rabbit hole. So, um, yeah, I I would say that was um, that was the moment for me. Very interesting. And then you worked backwards. So 9-11 was not obvious to you at the time, but once you watched um the the name of that again the canadian uh money is debt by paul grignon okay no 911 i remember i was actually doing my um masters so we take a week out of work to go and do it and i remember seeing it on the tv at the time of course instantly the second plane um hit the building you're like okay that's not an accident but we were literally straight back into it. And um, yeah, I probably made the mistake at the time of uh, reading some newspapers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't had a TV for 25 years and I haven't read a mainstream newspaper probably now in about eight years <laughs> because I refuse to pay someone to be lied to. Yeah, yeah. Well, let I want to touch on psychology of what's going on. And, uh, you know, people like Matthias Desmet who have theories Tell me what you think the overriding psychology of, of the mass, well, I, I don't, mass psychosis is what Matthias Desmond would refer to this. Give me your view on this phenomenon going, going on, the psychology of the psychosis or whatever. Okay, so I mean, um, first I think he's right on uh, one side of this equation, but I don't necessarily agree with all of his conclusions. 
Um, so I think mass formation psychosis is um, a good framework for seeing it through. Um, I mean, there's been other people in the past who've looked at, uh, I mean, his book called like The Madness of Crowds and how they work. Um, but it's how we got into that state, and that was through uh, military-grade propaganda and the inducing of fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, why do you need to induce fear? Because basically, if you can get people in a state of fear, it switches off their critical thinking ability. You're not using your rational part of your brain. You're only using emotion. In short, fear makes you stupid, which is why they're permanently trying to keep you in a state of fear uh, in order to control you. Now, uh, where I diverge from his assessment, I would say, and I think he's got some excellent points, uh, so I'm not um, critiquing the person, but as for the observation, I think he said that uh, the people were to blame, I think, for entering that state. Well, yeah, if uh, your government, military and, every, and the media are uh, force-feeding you military-grade propaganda, then I'm not sure you can uh, put the blame at the door of the people, if that's his observation. And I would also say he makes one thing which uh, I think he says people tend to overestimate that there's this type of evil cabal in the background. Well, my experience is that people tend to underestimate that because they all think it couldn't be possible and therefore don't consider it. So that's where I would agree and diverge. I think that's an important point that people underestimate the, uh, the extent of collaboration and planning that's gone on here. I would, I agree. I, don't I mean, David Rockefeller said um, everything is placed after 500 years now to make this happen. So um, a lot of these people are thinking intergenerationally, not just in one lifetime. And that's partly through the societies. But I also really wonder back to uh, the early discussion on reincarnation, whether they think they can come back again. Because why would you be looking at those terms? That raises a massive question um, uh, way beyond that. Uh, but yeah, that, those are some of the timescales we're dealing with. Mm. What about controlled opposition? Talk to me about your views of controlled opposition. It comes up a lot in our circles. It does. Uh, I've renamed it in the book. I've called it Bikini Opposition. <laughs> and that's because of uh, it refers to a slightly sexist quip made by Aaron Lewenstein, I think in 1951, and he was comparing statistics with bikinis. And he said, uh, what they reveal is uh, suggestive, what they conceal is vital. Mm. And so I think this is important because for a lot of people with controlled opposition, it's easier to identify in the abstract than in the practical day to day. Uh, so it's not about what they are revealing. My point is about what they're concealing. So you can be 99% reveal and only 1% conceal, but you're still doing the job. Why? Because the 99% reveal doesn't have a fundamental effect on the overall status quo. Whereas the 1% would maybe, if it came out, turn over the apple cart, and therefore that can't be let out um, under any circumstances. But the 99 might cause a whole fuss um, and brouhaha, but it's not going to change the system. And so I refer to it as bikini opposition because I think it plants in people's brains about that reveal conceal uh, uh, factor and the fact they can be so very much out of a line. It's the 1% that's absolutely vital that you're concealing. That's a very clever term. I like that. I know that CJ Hopkins has written extensively about this as well. And I think he calls it limited hangout. Um, but I yeah. also like bikini opposition. I think it's so true. There are so many people in that camp who, well, let's talk about some of the big examples. 
of uh, bikini opposition? Who are your favorite examples? Um, probably the one that most people would find the most surprising, and I uh, give an example of, uh, is Julian Assange. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll explain my reasoning for that. So, um, by the way, I've quoted Julian several times in the book in a positive light. I make it very clear that uh, I have nothing against the guy and I think he's being persecuted. OK, put that to one side. Uh, but you've got to look at what people say. So, for example, he was interviewed by the Belfast Telegraph in 2010 and said, I think the words were, I'm sick and tired of people dealing in false conspiracy theories like 9-11. And you go, uh, I'm sorry. Here's a guy who basically studies conspiracy day in, day out. He's highly intelligent. Why would he not know about all the truths behind 9-11? Because it's the easiest one to dismantle of the lot. So he could have chosen not to say anything. Perfectly reasonable stance to take because it isn't necessarily what he's focused on. But to issue an outright denial, well, that sends the alarm bells going for me. And uh, what I say is that his WikiLeaks exposure and his exposure of all the war crimes in Iraq shouldn't be, um, yeah, the reason for covering up why we went in the first place. So people can make their own judgments. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not here to uh, slag people off. I'm just looking at how we navigate this terrain and we we have to question even those that we maybe love so people like john campbell or um there's a lot of people russell brand who've had tremendous success on youtube have been allowed to exist they seem to be impermeable to censorship are you suspicious of people like this well i think Russell Brands has uh, just been taken out, hasn't he? Um, look, we, I've got lots of um, insights into this, but I don't particularly want to make a big point because I'm not interested in, um, you know, chatting about personalities. A mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think with John Campbell, he's quoted in my book from the early days because he was highlighting um, the benefits of vitamin D and saying, why isn't the government talking about this? Um, and so, and I think he has uh, a good way of explaining stuff, you know, like, uh, tell it like you're a two-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, John, I think, is probably a classic example of someone who totally believed in the system before the COVID-19 um, false flag hit, and it took him a long time to get there. However, what I did say was I could see the tide turning, and but it took him, I think, two years or so to get there. But I said, well, he's got two million followers. That's important in order to move them from position A to position B. But on the flip side of that, the damage is already done. We need to be listening to people who are warning in advance not telling you afterwards that um, they got it wrong. Yeah. And there is a danger here. So, mm -hmm. again, John's done a lot of good things. I'm not slagging him off, but there is a major problem with that. And this brings us to a wider point, which is uh, something called revelation of method, which um, in black magic, uh, the end of the spell is revealing the spell of what you've done to people. And the fact you acquiesced and went along with it is sort of seen as the completion of the spell when we show you what's been done. So uh, it's not really useful after two, year, two years after the event, or however long it is, um, to sort of do a re revelation, because I believe at the back of this, there's a possibility they want you to lose faith in everything. They want you to lose faith in the legal system, the medical profession, the media, uh, and even yourself. Mm -hmm. So how's the best way to get you to lose faith in the medical profession? Well, 
it's to get the medical profession to stuff a load of injections into you and then reveal how nefarious it was. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, oh, now I don't believe in that. So it's about trying to break you. They want Agenda 2030 is about making you uh, uh, cold, hungry and desperate. Yeah. yeah. So it's all about can you break the human spirit? So the way we win this, you just go, I'm unbreakable. Do what you want. Do whatever you want. But I am not going to acquiesce. I'm not going to comply. And most of all, you ain't going to be able to break me mentally. And that that actually needs to be our mantra, doesn't it? We we do not comply and stay positive. So so yeah. how do we proceed? Besides not complying, how else do you think we should be focusing our energy? Okay, so um, I think most of us have done a lot of what we can call the war reporting over the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, the chronicling, maybe being the scribe, telling people what's going on. At yeah. some point, we have to move away from that because we know what's going on now. There's a bunch of transnational uh, Luciferian sociopaths who want to maim and kill us and completely enslave us. OK, so whatever the current thing is this week isn't really going to change my opinion on that big picture. But right. if all we're doing is reporting on the current thing and explaining it, we're not doing what we should be, which is the great work on ourselves and creating parallel societies and coming up with, OK, when this thing collapses and it will collapse because this is what's happened throughout history, we who are aware now to start coming out, I think need to start coming out with, uh, OK, vision of what the future is going to look like. Yeah. And that is where we should be putting our energy, I think, from now on. So we can keep one eye on the psychopaths by all means, but keep one uh, eye. But I guess the ultimate question is: Will the psychopaths allow a parallel society to exist? I think where we are in the huge wheel of samsara, end of times, whatever you want to call it, they won't actually get the say in it. Do you think it's because our numbers will are growing so much that they won't be able to deal with us? Like, do you think the opposition is growing leaps and bounds right now? Well, we only have to look at the difference between 2020 and now of how many people have come on board. Have we got to the absolute critical mass? I can't tell you because I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, it's building, and I say the truth is like a one-way valve. There's no one who's come on to our side ever going back. No, it's a one it's a one way trip. But I yeah. I sense that in the UK, your the stampede to truth is a lot faster and and sizable than what we're experiencing in Canada. Um, I spent some time in England this summer, and I was shocked to see how aware people were of the reality. Coming back to Canada, it was kind of discouraging. There's a lot of normies. Okay. Could be a cultural, could be a cultural thing, because in Canada, we're more isolated from each other. In Can in the UK, you're living in each other's pockets and you're in the pubs and you're We like the pub, Marianne. You like and the people pub. talk in pubs, which is you why they shut talking. them down during the lockdown. Whereas a pub in Canada is a place to go and pick up someone. Uh, so it is. It's, it has a different purpose in Canada. People don't hang out at pubs in Canada. Um, there may have been one or two people have been picked up in pubs in the UK, just FYI. But yeah, I get the. But your your pubs are delightful. You know, the children are there, the dogs are there. Um, there's good pub fare. It's it's something that you go to during the day. Our pubs, you go to at night, dressed to the nines. You know, so it's a different. Right. It's a different phenomenon but also i was saying to some the other day the brits they love to walk and they amble and they talk and um they all have pets that need to be walked and so it's the culture is such that i think you guys are talking a lot more exchanging ideas in canada less so 
And I think that's okay. to our detriment because I don't feel that we are <laughs> getting people to uh, become aware nearly fast enough. It worries me in Canada. I'm quite confident that the UK is going to, uh, you know, arrive well. Um, well, yeah, be, but we better get there quickly because uh, I think uh, we're about to have a large tyrannical boot stamp on our faces. What What are you predicting? Do you think it's going to be a climate crisis or another pandemic? What What do you think? What strategy do you think they're going to use next? Well, they're clearly using the climate crisis, the non-existent climate crisis, mm -hmm. um, in order to try and push a lot of this stuff. I mean, I would say over here, I don't know if you've heard about what's happening with the ULES cameras oh, in London. Oh, incredible. But you, a lot of resistance on that. With yeah, the, the, a lot of them being chopped down. The cameras, going out with, what do you with call With angle them? grinders and just chopping them. You've got what do you call the group that's chopping all these cameras down on everyone's uh, blade platform? runners? Blade runners, yeah. I've seen some footage and it's rather interesting to watch. You know, by night, there it sounds as though very interesting phenomenon. So that takes a lot of people to be resisting and saying, No, sorry, you're not going to charge us to leave our driveway if we don't have an electric vehicle. Yeah. Uh, it's just insane what's happening with your, yeah, the ULEZ and your 15-minute cities. We're not there yet in Canada, but it's coming. No, oh, it's coming everywhere. So yeah, it's coming really like funny. a steam train as well. So, I mean, with all these things, it's a question of how do you get it, uh, as many people awake as possible? So, I mean, we've touched on it earlier in terms of the framework and the 10 techniques. What I didn't mention, but is worth mentioning now maybe, is how do you get that message out to everyone? Yes. And I say the main thing is they have the money in the media, we have the numbers. So all you have to do is leverage those numbers in a sensible and meaningful way. And the way to do that is just ask people to go and have 10 conversations using the techniques that have been provided. Because if you have a room, if you take the UK, for example, there's about 70 million people. If you have a room of, say, 70 people, and they're all prepared to go out and have 10 conversations, you can get to everyone in the country in just six steps. So, for example, you start with 70 times 10 is 700, step one. Step two, 7,000. Step three, 70,000. Step four, 700,000. Step five, 7 million. Step six, 70 million. But you don't need to reach 70 million because you only need a critical mass of about three and a half to five percent. So, OK, there'd be chain breakages and things like that. But in theory, you can get there in just five steps. So that's the final part is some basic geometric progression maths in order to help people get the message out. And I hope from, um, from the feedback I've got, uh, there's some people who've gone from sort of asleep to totally awake in one read through of the book. Okay, so this book, we're going to definitely 180 degrees, uh, get that book into as many hands as you can. And if someone's overwhelmed with it because of the size, would you say read a certain chapter to kind of get started? Yeah, yeah, easy. Um, tell them just to read the prologue, which is two and a half pages and see how you go. Because that was the advice I got from uh, a gentleman who came to a talk in Lancaster. And he said, I've got a story for you. I said, OK, what is it? He said, uh, I bought and read your book. I said, thank you very much. He said, yeah, I gave it to my friend's teenage son who doesn't read books. And I said, hmm, how did that go? He said, we well, took one look at it and he said, what the F am I going to do with that? And he said, well, read the prologue and see how you go. Well, the teenage boy who doesn't read books finished mine in two weeks flat. That You know, I think that's a great tip. So read the prologue and then you'll be hooked. Yeah, just read the prologue and see how yeah. you go. Yes. But hopefully, if I've done my job properly, that will be enough to get them to read the whole damn thing. Okay, so we'll try to get this book into as many hands as possible. And maybe it is okay to give to someone who's not aware of what's going on with that suggestion. And they may crack it one evening when they're entirely bored or curious or 
It's just yeah. sitting there on the coffee table. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it's available on Amazon. Some people don't want to buy it from Amazon, understandable. But, um, you know, it, it, it gives a global distribution that wouldn't be possible without it. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for anyone who doesn't want to do that, they can contact me um on my email address which is fergus greenwood at protonmail.com that's fergus the irish spelling f-e-a-r-g-u-s greenwood at protonmail.com uh but i know post i have sent a few out to america and canada uh but the post uh postage is pretty expensive well so, especially uh, on, a would... book, on a book this size it's like yeah. shipping a brick <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, I direct people to Amazon as first port of call. It'll be cheaper. Yes. Um, you know what? I have two niggling questions. Are there any countries that you think are successfully resisting? Um, well, I think the only one who actually took the bull by the horns is Iceland. Oh, tell um, me. Yeah, because... Um, I think it was Birgitta Jon's daughter who uh, was head of the Pirate Party. And she said, after the financial crisis, she said it wasn't just the banks that had been corrupted. It was all upper echelons of society. It was the media. It was academia. It was everything. Mm -hmm. So obviously those in power didn't want to let go of power. but uh, And maybe this doesn't work in a bigger country, but it did with Iceland. So... Um, I believe like 50 people went and camped out on the prime minister's front lawn and just banged pots and pans 24 seven for a week. <laughs> and at that point he capitulated and gave in. And uh, so there's some useful direct action for you. Non-aggressive, but obviously intolerable. And what um, she said is they reverted to some sort of quasi sortition approach, which was to go to the communities and ask them to nominate someone they thought had would be suitable uh, for standing for office and, you know, of good integrity and this type of thing. And so they were able to clean sweep a lot of that corruption out via that process. But it does, the point you raise does bring us to a more important point, which I think, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the Victorians, but um, back in the day, it wasn't about your personality, it was about your character. You know, did you have morality and integrity? Where in any of our voting systems does that even come on the radar? It seems almost like the worse they are, the more likely they are to get in. So uh, there is an expression saying uh, you get the government you deserve. Mm. And I think uh, we all need to look to ourselves and our own standards with regard to that and start demanding that the people in office um, actually, um, you know, have that good character and not just career politicians. But to do that, probably the whole system's got to collapse. I think it probably will. It'll certainly get messy uh, before it gets reorganised. Yeah. But I remain an optimist. Uh, I have a friend, Abner, who's uh, very tuned in. And I said, Abner, give me the big picture. He said, look, this is like one big boil full of pus that's yet to burst. <laughs> yeah, it's going to burst. It won't be in too distant future. And after that, maybe things can start getting better. But uh, I do hope there's enough of us have come back this time, uh, yeah, uh, to make sure that we win. And I believe we will. Well, that is a very, I love your optimism. Um, I'm curious to know how we can read more about Iceland because I, I feel like I've been under a rock on this topic. So Iceland. We could fly to Reykjavik, maybe, Marianne. I, you know, it's. In, I've been there. I was in Iceland uh, right before COVID. Love the country, but I had no idea that they resisted any of this nonsense the last few years. Or has this I, been more recent? 
I don't. I'm talking about the financial crisis and the sweep out. I oh, don't actually. The, yes, yes, the finance. Well, back the, in 2008. That I haven't. That's right. I Just haven't followed what they've done with regard to the vaccines, so uh, I yes. honestly couldn't tell you. So I'm just giving an example of something that seemed to uh, actually work. Right, right. Yes, the financial aspect, I had heard that because they went bankrupt and then they restructured everything from the ground up and it was a complete success story. But I haven't heard any positive stories coming out of Africa or out of Africa, out of Iceland. Um, there were some attempts in Africa, but those leaders were killed. Um, but I, there's no other country that you think is actively successfully resisting th since COVID began. Do you think there not, are? I'm country? not that I'm particularly aware of. I mean, no. the, the point with this is until we change our monetary system, we change nothing. Yeah, that's central, isn't it? Absolutely. No yeah, no pun intended. As, as long as you've central. got, mm -hmm. um, you know, a few people who are benefiting from the ability to print money out of thin air, charge interest on it, and then mm -hmm. transfer that interest into tangible assets. Um, I think I said when I was interviewed by Richard Vobes, you don't need to be a mathematician mathematician to work out. Eventually, you end up owning everything. Yeah. It's... You know, that's how it's going to be. So if you're struggling to pay your mortgage or you're suffering from inflation, inflation is generally because of the increase in the money supply. And that's what we've been doing. But we're getting it from every angle at the moment. Yes. But sometimes it's just good to zoom out view this from uh, a perspective, it's difficult when you're only here for maybe 80 years or something, but see this from a perspective of millions of years and what's going on. And uh, yeah, we've been here before. It was the same battle, I believe, between the Belial group and the Amelius group in Atlantis, except this time we get to win it. I think we will win. So on that bright note, uh, now, uh, Fergus, where can people follow you? They can't. So you don't have a Substack. They need to buy your book. No Substack, no, no website, substack. no social media presence. I have an email address. Uh, occasionally I give a talk. And of course, I do uh, some podcast interviews. Uh, yeah, I'm keen if there's anyone in the States or furthermore in Canada uh, I'd be keen to do some uh, more on that front. But yeah, I'm pretty low key, I'm afraid. Well, Sorry. <laughs> well, keep writing because I think you're an excellent writer. And the content is, you know, you go deep and it, it's rich content. Um, so I encourage you to do that. But what a fascinating conversation. Fergus O'Connor Greenwood. What a delight to chat today. I feel enlightened and I really, it's been so interesting. So thank you for taking the time. No, thank you, Marianne. It's been lovely. Okay, we'll talk again. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you.